This is Duke University. From the time I pulled together the materials for my gender and law casebook back in the 1990s, I have drawn on her work at the intersection of feminism and international human rights. Through various articles, book chapters, and essays, Karen has kept the field organized in terms of the various strands of feminist thought in international human rights law, from the liberal phase of including women in the law to feminist structural critiques of the law, to concern for the Western feminist failure to take account of the particular, to particularity of third world women, third world in inverted commas, and the evolution of a compromised brand of culturally sensitive feminist universalism, also in inverted commas. Engel has been engaged both in the construction of feminist theory in international human rights law and in the critique of the prevailing theories and norms. She has shown herself courageous in challenging certain feminist sacred cows. Perhaps the best example are her warnings about equating rape with genocide, which she argues has facilitated the crisis mentality used to rationalize a number of undesirable military interventions. And of course, we've read some of this work. In one of my favorite pieces of hers, I suspect it might actually be that piece, she challenges stereotypes about female victims of war. She says these stereotypes ignore women's agency in war, including their role as soldiers, perpetrators of violence, political actors, and even sexual aggressors. International human rights law, she contains, all too often fails to acknowledge the possibility of female agency. One of her most recent works is the book the Elusive Promise of Indigenous Development, Rights, Culture, Strategy, published by our own Duke University Press in 2010. In this book, Karen challenges the ascendance of a cultural rights model of indigenous peoples, which has essentialized notions of indigenous culture or heritage in a way that has led to the exclusion of many claimants, forced others into norms of cultural cohesion, and limited their access to economic profits from development as well as political and territorial autonomy. This book received the best book award from the American Political Science Association. <clears throat> Karen has had her project supported by the Rockefeller Foundation. She received a Bellagio Fellowship in 2009 and by the F Fulbright Fellowship Program also. Her work is amazingly global, eclectic, careful, provocative, and boundary expanding. Besides being the Minerva House Dysdale Regents Chair in Law at the University of Texas School of Law, she is founder and co-director of the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice. We are enormously, enormously privileged to have Karen speaking to us today about the grip of sexual violence. Thanks to Kate Bartlett for that wonderful and undeserved introduction. Um, and you read it quite well, Ranji. And, um, and I am disappointed not to be able to see Kate here. So I, I wish her, I hope she's, she's getting better. Um, but you all are very lucky to have her here. Um, I, I, I want to um, say it is a real honor, but it's also a lot of fun to be here uh, this weekend. And, um, it's really been an incredible conference, and I want to thank um, Ranji for the invitation and also for her long-lasting, if I can use the word, friendship, um, and uh, also collegiality. Um, I want to thank Kim Carlisle for her assistance in getting me here and her patience um, in doing that. Um, and I know there are many, many people behind the scenes, uh, and part of why uh, this works is because you all are making it work, so thanks to you as well. Um, and, and finally, I, I, I have to thank Penelope, um, Karen, and Alondra for their inspiring work and presentations. And the only thing is, you know, you want them to do as great as they did, but they've set the bar so high um, that I went home and I studied everything I could about quantum physics, <laughs> hoping I could leap at least <laughs> close to the bar. Um, and I decided that I could find some help if I started with Angelina Jolie. <laughs> so, and Ken's tweeting over there, don't tweet that. Um, so, um, 
Last June, Angelina Jolie addressed the United Nations Security Council about what, about what she called the, quote, sad, upsetting, and indeed shameful reality, end quote, of sexual violence. The occasion for her comments was an open debate on sexual violence and conflict around Security Council Resolution 2016, uh, 2106. It's 2016. That resolution is one of the most recent of some 21 resolutions that over the past 15 years, the Security Council has passed all unanimously on what it calls human security. That is, on the protection of civilians during and after armed conflict. Although many of those 21 resolutions mention sexual violence, resolution, I guess it is 2106, is the second resolution to focus nearly exclusively on sexual violence against women, men, and children. Urging the Security Council to adopt and implement Resolution 2106, Jolie focused on women as she chided the world for not yet having, quote, taken up war zone rape as a serious priority, despite hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of victims, end quote. In doing so, she expressed what I contend have become mainstreamed understandings of the harms and source of sexual violence as well as of a reliance on criminalization as a response to it. She emphasized, for example, that, quote, rape is a tool of war, an act of aggression, and a crime against humanity that is inflicted intentionally to destroy the woman, the family, and the community, end quote. After noting the dearth of prosecutions for sexual violence, Jolie continued, survivors, quote, suffer most at the hands of their rapists, but they are also victims of a culture of impunity, end quote. Only when perpetrators are, quote, finally held to account will they at least feel that they are on safer, will they at last feel that they are on safer ground. So the issue I'd like to pose for you this afternoon is about the grip of sexual violence on human rights and security discourse, such as that reflected in Jolie's speech to the UN Security Council which followed on a very similar speech she had given on behalf of the G8. Notice how people are looking at her up there. Um, especially Foreign Secretary Haig. I do not want to address the violence itself, but to consider why many feminist and even non-feminist discussions about human rights and security have become inextricably connected to concerns about sexual violence primarily but not exclusively against women. In other works, I'm tracing the roots of that connection to the way in which the women's rights as human rights movement developed in the early 1990s. And I'd be happy to talk about that in the Q&A if people like. But today, I'll address this question through discussion and analysis of the 21 UN Security Council resolutions that I mentioned and of the debates and media around them. I do so because I believe they're representative of an escalating emphasis on the horrors of sexual violence within international rights, humanitarian law, discourse, and advocacy. Thus, I'll situate the resolutions for you within three trends that I see in human rights and humanitarian law and advocacy more generally. First, the past few years have seen increased attention to sexual violence even as against gender-based violence against women. Sometimes the two are elided, while other times women are no longer the specific concern. Either way, the prevailing view of sexual violence continues to be that it is a fate worse than death. Second, human rights law, advocacy, and discourse have, over the past two decades, increasingly turned to criminal law for enforcement with the fight against impunity as central to that turn. Consequently, those who oppose sexual violence often do so by focusing on ending impunity for perpetrators. Third, celebrity calls for first world solidarity with mostly third world victims of human rights violations have become increasingly popular in recent years. Some of the work of the UN to end sexual, conflict, sexual violence in conflict deploys such calls. These three trends partly come together in the work of UN Action Against Sexual Violence, or UN Action, as I'll refer to it, a multi-agency initiative begun in 2007 to bring attention and response to sexual violence in war. 
Its Stop Rape Now campaign is a multimedia and largely web-based effort designed to provoke indignation at sexual violence, with at least the partial hope that it will result in individuals pressuring Security Council member states to pass resolutions against sexual violence. In the third part of my talk, I'll consider two YouTube videos produced and disseminated by UN Action, and will argue that in their attempt to appeal to first world outrage, they oversimplify both sexual violence and conflict in ways that display and reinforce an assumption that victims are forever destroyed, in part due to shame and stigmatization that they see as accompanying sexual violence and conflict. Similar oversimplifications can be seen in the resolutions, as well as in the international criminal responses to sexual violence that the Security Council resolutions reinforce. Now, there has been a debate among feminists with regard to these resolutions. So some feminists, primarily those in the women's peace movement, and there is still one, if you didn't know, um, and it's active in this context, prim prim primarily through um, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, um, which is a century old. Um, they've expressed concern about the Security Council's, at times, near-exclusive focus, at the behest of other feminists, on women as victims of sexual violence. In response, they've called for more resolutions that concentrate on enhancing women's roles as peace builders. And I share with some of them a concern that what began as calls for an analysis of the gendered nature and production of war and peace have often been responded to by an emphasis on the harm of sexual violence against women, I push beyond that critique um, by showing how, over time, the scope has been extended to sexual violence against men and children, both boys and girls, as well. And I explore, perhaps more than most of those critics, what the attention to sexual violence means. I do so at the risk of perpetuating the very hyper-attention to sex I criticize. I attribute much of this hyperattention to something akin to what queer theorists call sex panic. Seen through this lens, the Security Council resolutions, including those promoted by the women's peace movement, as I'll show, aid in the production of, or at least reinforcement, of particular types of proper sexuality, heterosexual, of a certain age, monogamous, within the same ethnic group, and so on. They also, perhaps inadvertently for some, reinforce the shame of rape. So I'll make my argument by first giving you some of the context of the resolutions and demonstrating how they've become increasingly concerned with sexual rather than gender-based violence against both males and females. I'll then consider the various understandings of the harm of sexual violence that the resolutions convey and discuss how the sense of harm both influences and is influenced by the increased attention on criminalization. I'll then turn to UN Action's multimedia campaign to show how some of the same assumptions and trends I identify in the resolutions can be found there, as well as to shed light on how human rights law and discourse circulate in that public space. Finally, I'll suggest some ways in which we might begin to challenge the representations of the harm of rape, as well as the solutions and responses that are often presumed. So the resolutions. Initially prompted in part by a group of states that banded together in 1999 to form the Human Security Network, the UN Security Council resolutions on human security largely embody international humanitarian law and increasingly seek to apply the rules not only to state and non-state actors, but to the UN as well in its peacekeeping operations. The resolutions are a distinct type of Security Council action in that they have no specific enforcement mechanism and are not legally binding. So you might say they're not important. But they nevertheless have become an important site, as I think you'll see, both for those who advocate for greater criminalization of sexual violence and those who push for a stronger UN focus on women and peace building. They also reproduce and fuel many of the conceptions of the harm of sexual violence that can be found in calls for military intervention and in the international criminal adjudication of sexual violence and conflict which I've discussed elsewhere. Now, as is the pattern with Security Council resolutions in general, which you may or may not know, there's a lot of repetition, which you can imagine, and self-reference in these resolutions. 
And each one becomes more spe specific than the one that preceded it about the harm to be attended to and the various enforcement mechanisms that should be used to address it. Um, in 2009, the Security Council passed four resolutions, all in one year, that are really reflect reflective of a trend that I'll describe. So one of the resolutions was on civilians as a general category, um, one on children, and two on women. So all seen as distinct, if obvious, not if, if overlapping categories. And the two resolutions on women, there were two because one is primarily on women as victims of war, while the other considers the need to ensure women's participation in peace building. In 2010, however, Resolution 1960 broke the mold by turning from the categories of civilians, children, and women to addressing sexual violence as a theme. And it was followed by a similar resolution last year. So I'll give you now a bit of numerical soup. Um, Security Resolution 1325 passed in 2000 is the first of the Security Council resolutions on women, so it wasn't the first one, but specifically on women, that feminists and women's peace activists often focus on. And if you've only heard of one resolution, my guess is that's the one you've heard of. It's often considered, along with Resolution 1889, so, which is on the right, yes, you're right, on the left side, so in red, I'm gonna talk about those first briefly. So it's often considered along with Resolution 1889, um, which is one of the 2009 resolutions, and a quite recent resolution, um, 2122. And they're considered as somewhat exceptional because they focus on the role of women in peace building rather than on women's victimization in war as civilians, or at least that's how they're portrayed. The resolutions are generally contrasted then with resolutions 1820, 1888, 1960, and 2106 on the right, um, which as I just mentioned are seen by a number of women's peace activists to place too much emphasis on women's victimization. I contend, however, that in reality, in terms of their representation of women, of, of women as victims of sexual violence, and they all talk about women as victims, it's just a matter of emphasis, um, they've turned out not to be that different. Because the peace building resolutions also include language and representation about the effects of violence against women that remain unquestioned, they often end up sounding quite similar. They also suggest a view that is not that dissimilar to many other resolutions that have attended to the protection of civilians and children in wartime. Thus, while most feminists who have considered the treatment of sexual violence in the resolutions have concentrated on these resolutions specific to women and sexual violence, I believe we gain important insight into the Security Council's understanding of both gender-based and sexual violence when looking at them in tandem with the other resolutions. So the ones I just put up are more broadly on civilians, um, and then there are those that pertain primarily to children. So everybody take a moment to memorize them all. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm gonna save you, because before getting into more detail on the resolutions, um, which I'll refer to mostly in broad strokes after this, but um, let me first offer a quotation from someone who arguably has more power than Angelina Jolie. <laughs> that is, argu arguably, that is former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who was providing over the Security Council in September 2009 when it passed um, Security Council Resolution 1888, which is one of the ones focused um, primarily on women as victims of sexual violence. And the following is her official statement on the resolution. Under the UN Charter, the 15 members of this council bear primary responsibility for protecting the lives and physical security of all people, including the women who comprise half the planet's population. Even though women and children are rarely responsible for initiating armed conflict, they are often war's most vulnerable and violated victims. Now Clinton's statement is representative of the extent to which many of the resolutions function to remove responsibility from women, children, and other vulnerable civilians for initiating, even participating in war. Rather, they're seen as victims of war, vulnerable and violated. This is true regardless whether the resolutions focus more on women as sexual victims or call for their greater participation in peacemaking. With very few exceptions, in the form of a call for reintegration of female ex-soldiers, 
The resolutions do not see women as participants in military or political operations, especially those that violate humanitarian law. If they are to play such a role, um, which as I will suggest some, some are seen absolutely as incapable of doing, it would be through their greater inclusion in the peace process. Now, while I don't go into much, won't go into much greater detail here about the ongoing denial of women's multiple roles, military, political, and sexual, in and during armed conflict and preceding armed conflict, I think it's important to see as a starting point that any, any agency in these regards is generally denied. And it's denied by a regime that represents governance feminism, a term coined by Janet Fa Halley to refer to, quote, the incremental but by now quite noticeable installation of feminists and feminist ideas in actual legal institutional power, end quote. Now, as I've shown um, in part in the article that was distributed uh, to folks here, feminists, at least of a certain type, um, are no longer outsiders, particularly in the international governance of sexual violence. Now let me take you through my analysis of the resolutions. And I'll obviously generalize here with regard to them, so allow me to make, without giving you uh, many block quotations for proof, the following observations. <laughs> and these arrows really move in one direction. Um, <laughs> they move from gender-based violence, the resolutions, um, to sexual violence against women and children. And they move from sexual violence against women and children to sexual violence against everyone. Let me elaborate. So on the gender-based violence to sexual violence, the first mention of sexual violence at all can be found in Security Council Resolution 1261, um, which was passed in 1999. That resolution, which was the first specifically on children, is also the first to mention gender-based violence, urging parties of armed conflict to protect, quote, protect children, in particular girls, from rape and other forms of sexual and gender-based violence. The resolution thus sees rape as one form of both sexual and gender-based violence. That understanding is continued um, in Resolution 1325 um, in 2000. Yet every resolution since 1325, and you can see that there were many of them, whether generally about civilians or specifically about children or women, mentions the need to protect that group from sexual violence, whichever it is. The term gender-based violence has, however, dropped out, quite intentionally, as we'll see in a moment. In terms of the second move, from Resolution 1325 in 2000, through Resolution 1820 and 2008, most of the attention on sexual violence, even in the resolutions about civilians and children, singled out women as, and girls as particularly vulnerable to it, um, such as we just saw even in the earlier resolutions. Thus, um, while later resolutions, well, so up until 1325, they specifically mention, mentioned it, then um, the resolutions no longer discuss gender-based violence, but they still focus um, on girls uh, and women in a particular way, which would presumably include the gendered effects or motives of other types of violence. Um, so they see sexual violence as gendered even without using the term. With Resolution 1820, though, um, in 2008, things began uh, to change. Um, and, and we can see this um, particularly in 2010 with Security Council Resolution 1960, where gender neutrality became explicit. And so a lot of what I'll talk about is, is 1960, that's the one, um, because that's the moment when they first uh, uh, quite intentionally make it gender neutral. That resolution has sexual violence as its theme, that's the one that broke the mold, I said, and it sets up what the UN itself has called a, quote, naming and shaming, end quote, mechanism, by which, quote, parties credibly suspected of patterns of sexual violence are to be listed along with detailed information on such parties. The resolution uses the term conflict-related sexual violence and reflects an intentional move away from previous terminology. According to Margot Wallstrom, who was at the time the Secretary General's Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict, um, the new explicit concentration on sexual violence was needed because, quote, 
Sexual violence as a tactic or consequence of war could not be captured under existing categories. Cases against men and boys did not fall under violence against women. Harmful traditional practices mischaracterized sexual violence as cultural or traditional. And gender-based violence did not reflect sexual violence as a method of ethnic cleansing or as a tactic of war." End quote. Actually, a tactic of terror, end quote. Similarly, UN Action's summary of its analytical and conceptual framing of conflict-related sexual violence, um, a document put together to determine the criteria with, by which parties credibly suspected, so they, those same parties credibly suspected of patterns of sexual violence, um, are to be listed under that naming and shaming resolution, um, consider 1960 as a recognition by the Security Council that conflict-related sexual violence is now a, quote, self-standing issue of concern. To foster greater specificity and disaggregation of incidents, UN Action contends that, quote, conflict-related sexual violence should no longer be treated as synonymous or interchangeable with um, a number of terms, including gender-based violence, and violence against women, end quote. For the listing purpose of 1960, UN Action defines conflict-related sexual violence, in fact, quite broadly. So on one hand, they've narrowed it to sexual violence, but then it's, in fact, a pretty broad term. Um, it's just that it's explicitly about sex. So thus, it covers, quote, rape, sexual slavery, forced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization, or any other form of sexual violence of comparable gravity against women, men, boys, or girls, end quote. Now, the Security Council's gender neutrality in 1960 has been lauded by many, including Harvard University's Program on Humanitarian Policy and Conflict, which notes that the resolution is distinct from previous resolutions which it asserts as important because, quote, the resolution's operative paragraphs implicitly recognize that adult men may also be victims of sexual violence and armed conflict. For others, however, the separation of sexual violence from gender is problematic. So that's my comment. Um, as the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom states in the report on a 2011 conference it sponsored, quote, sexual violence in conflict and post-conflict settings should be understood as a component of a broader category of gender-based violence. If sexual and gender-based violence is approached too narrowly, donor agents run the risk of attacking the symptom while failing to thoroughly address discriminating gender relations as one of the underlying problems." End quote. In June 2013, though, the Security Council passed a follow-up resolution on sexual violence in conflict. Um, and it basically followed 1960, except made it stronger. So expressing deep concern with what it called the slow implementation of 1960, Resolution 2106, with which I began, offers greater operational detail than 1960, and also focuses more intensely on ending impunity for sexual violence. Moreover, it explicitly, so it's not just gender neutral now, but it explicitly recognizes men and boys as victims of sexual violence, thereby confirming the trend toward gender neutrality um, that we saw in 1960 and that actually I would, I would say dates back even um, earlier. Now without commenting directly on the debate about whether sexual violence against men and women should be treated similarly or receive equal amounts of attention, I hope to have documented here the way in which a concern with gender-based violence against women in conflict has over the time been transformed into a concern about sexual violence. That said, it would be a mistake to think that the focus has in fact shifted to men and boys. Women continue to be regarded as the primary victims. The mention of men and boys, I think, though, has been used. It has actually facilitated the concentration on the sexual component of the violence as what is particularly harmful. So I now want to turn uh, to the harm. The Security Council resolutions might have over the years suggested varying views on who are the principal victims of sexual violence, but they've all been in agreement that the harm suffered is significant. In line with the second broad trend in human rights that I identified, the resolutions increasingly refer to sexual violence as an international criminal matter, indicating that it can constitute a war crime a crime against humanity 
or an act of genocide, as well as a violation of other prohibitions listed under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. They also increasingly referred to the need to end impunity for sexual violence, such that the UN titled the Security Council debate that preceded resolution, the passage of Resolution 2106, at which Jolie spoke. Um, it was entitled, quote, Addressing Impunity, Effective Justice for Crimes of Sexual Violence in Conflict. To the extent that the resolutions further delineate the harm of sexual violence as an international crime, they often describe it as a tactic of war, distinguished from a group of isolated events. At least in some articulations, the harm of shame constitutes a principal motive of the use of sexual violence as a war tactic. This view can be found, for example, in Resolution 1820, which notes that civilians, which notes the civilians account Sorry, let me try again. It notes, quote, civilians account for the vast majority of those adversely affected by armed conflict. Women and girls are particularly targeted by the use of sexual violence, including as a tactic of war to humiliate, dominate, instill fear in, disperse, and or forcibly relocate civilian members of a community or ethnic group. As you'll see shortly, UN Action uses similar language in its public campaign against sexual violence and conflict. The provision is also resonant of the arguments of those feminists who several years earlier had aimed to connect rape to ethnic cleansing and even genocide in the context of the former Yugoslavia, um, again, as I discussed in the article that was distributed for the seminar. And as I've discussed elsewhere, it clearly made that idea, uh, the connection of rape to genocide, clearly made its way into the jurisprudence of the International Criminal Tribunal for R Rwanda when it convicted Jean-Paul Akayeshu of responsibility for acts of rape that it found to be constitutive of genocide. And it did so in part because of the public humiliation brought by the rapes and the resulting, and this is a quote from the case, physical and psychological destruction of Tutsi women, their families, and their communities, end quote. In this understanding, sexual violence humiliates not only women and girls, but also their communities. It instills fear and shame in the entire community so that the community disperses or relocates. As the resolutions have become gender neutral, they've continued to refer to sexual violence as a tactic of war. The discourse surrounding these resolutions repeats some of the same assumptions of shame, which as the victim class expands, now is often extended to men. In a speech congratulating the Security Council for its passage of 1960, for example, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon stated, quote, victims are shamed and marginalized. Their husbands reject them. Men and boys who are sexually attacked often suffer isolation and discrimination. Just when these individuals need support from the communities, it falls away. And there's more. Sexual violence shatters lives, devastates countries, and destroys hope, end quote. It's almost impossible to recover from, which means that, quote, victims who might have contributed to development are shunned. Girls who might have grown into great leaders cannot even attend school. End quote. Rape victims are thus seen as different from most women and girls outside the West, who, as Interpol Grewal has noted, are, quote, represented as objects of charity and care by the West, but could become subjects who, but could become subjects who could participate in the global economy and become global citizens, end quote. To do that, or for women to be recognized as human, as she puts it, they must become autonomous individuals who could recognize their oppressions and struggles to become citizens of a global society. But the Security Council resolutions and attendant discourse treat victims of sexual violence and perhaps the communities from which they hail as beyond even the type of subjectivity that Gruwal describes. Others must step in to prevent, protect, and now the increasingly proposed solution, prosecute, so as to end impunity with the hope that doing so will stop sexual violence before it's allowed to cause its inevitable harm. <laughs>
During the open debate on Resolution 2106 on ending impunity, participants openly acknowledged this increasing focus on criminalization. The representative for the Women's Initiative for Gender Justice explained um, that the, quote, impunity gap created by the paucity of domestic prosecutions for crimes of sexual violence, the limited volume of international prosecutions for these crimes, and the scale worldwide of crimes of sexual violence is so distinct that it's had to become the focus of several resolutions, end quote. As a result, um, special representative uh, on the, 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 the new special representative on sexual violence and conflict, Zaina Bangura, pledged during that debate to provide the, quote, necessary resources to national authorities in their efforts to strengthen the rule of law response to sexual violence. And here we see a similar pattern, or a familiar pattern. Sexual violence is being used to justify neoliberal rule of law projects in the global south through strengthening of the penal state, sometimes in the midst of a civil war. Bangura also described a recent visit to Bosnia and Herzegovina and noted that despite unprecedented advances, she said, in international jurisprudence, quote, impunity still reigns. While the perpetrators have enjoyed the fruits of peace and have been free to rebuild their lives, the victims continue to work in the shadows of shame. By focusing on impunity, we make a more concerted effort to put the spotlight on the perpetrators. She's still talking. In doing so, we begin to redirect the stigma and the consequences of sexual violence from the survivors to the perpetrators. Note here that the shame is seen to shift, right? It's being redirected. That's a common refrain of the special representative, of you in action, and of many who support their work. Recall that Resolution 1960 included a provision that required the listing of names of those who were, who were credibly suspected. Um, and the UN has actually referred to that list as the list of shame. Um, in Bangura's statement, criminal law, like the list of shame, is meant to alleviate the harm of shame to the victims by placing it onto another group, the individual perpetrators, which might include those who command or condone it from above. How and if that process works is never discussed. It's simply assumed. And of course, it's a very individualized approach that ignores larger structural issues, including what we might call the root causes of armed conflict, of which the sexual violence is merely one part. This understanding of the harm of sexual violence as a shame at which the criminal apparatus is aimed is reflective of international humanitarian law more generally and is in need of contestation. Yet, it's often accepted even by its critics. So the Global Network of Women Peace Builders um, in a critical open letter to members of the Security Council complaining that Resolution 1960, quote, speaks only of women as victims of sexual abuse during conflict and does not mention that if women were recognized as participants in decision making, they'd be less vulnerable to attack, end quote, includes language about the effects of rape that largely agrees with 1960 and similar previous resolutions. So according to the letter, Rape, quote, rape is the worst crime that women or men can endure and survive. The trauma lasts a lifetime and has ripple consequences of ostracism from family and community as well as physical damage. Now remember, this is the letter criticizing 1960. This approach elides shame and honor and perpetuates the understanding of rape as a fate worse than death. It projects a Victorian idea of the effects of loss of honor, which in fact feminists who first considered sexual violence and conflict explicitly claimed to distance themselves from. And yet, it, it projects that idea onto women um, and all children and perhaps men in war-torn countries. Only now, their communities, even those communities that, have, that are victims of forced displacement, ethnic cleansing, or genocide, are often blamed for the effects. Moreover, as we saw in the Secretary General's statement, the resolutions and the discourse that produces and supports them reinforce the idea 
that women and girls, and now men and boys, who have experienced sexual violence can never be full citizens or even subjects of development in their own communities or elsewhere. So now I'll turn to the social media. And you might need a couple of video clips, so you'll get them. Um, the Security Council resolutions and their understanding of the harm of sexual violence are mirrored in the work of UN Action, which, as I said, was created in 2007. And it was created to, quote, unite efforts across the UN system with the goal of ending sexual violence during and in the aftermath of armed conflict, end quote. It combines the forces of 13 different UN entities, and it's supported by a coordinating secretariat that reports to the, the special representative um, on sexual violence and conflict, which I've mentioned a couple of times. UN Action lobbied for Resolution 1820. Um, if you haven't joined, you can do it now. I won't, I won't mind if you pull out your computers. Um, and has been tasked with monitoring, analyzing, and reporting um, on the later resolutions, especially the um, naming and shaming ones. Much of its effort has been put into its Stop Rape Now campaign, which is organized around a web-based advocacy strategy based on the theme, quote, get cross, no security without women's security. Through its engagement in a media campaign, UN Action demonstrates the third trend in human rights I mentioned, the popularization of human rights and the use of celebrity voices to champion various social justice and philanthropic initiatives. I turn to the campaign here both to highlight this trend and to continue to study representations of the harm of sexual violence. I should note that, though, that although UN Action has also begun to consider sexual violence against men and boys in its monitoring design, that consideration is not yet reflected in its media campaign, which only discusses women and girls. The, aim of UN Action's the aims of UN Action's campaign can perhaps best be understood by a question raised by the vag Vagina Monologues creator, um, Eve Ensler, who in recent years has taken her own project transnational. At the UN Action launch event at UN headquarters, Ensler, Ensler asked, quote, what is it about women getting raped that isn't grabbing people's attention, isn't seizing people's conscience, or isn't getting people to stand up, end quote. I would contend that far from being immune to rape, Insler's imagined audience, much as the Security Council in its unanimous passage of the resolutions, was more than ready to be seized by it. Still, she and you in action aim to get people from around the world to stand up in opposition to sexual violence and conflict. They therefore ended their launch event by having audience members stand with their arms crossed over their chests to show support for the effort. And that became the campaign's symbol. Now, while crossed arms could be seen as a don't touch me gesture or a handcuffs gesture, which I've learned has become quite controversial during sports matches, so one coach was recently suspended and fined 40,000 euros for using it um, to suggest his team had been victimized. Um, that's on the left. Other players were accused of showing solidarity for a teammate in prison on the right. Um, here, the, the, uh, the crossed arms were used to call on people around the world to get cross. One notice read, 200,000 women raped during the war in Congo. 200,000 people say, never again. Will you be one of them? And presumably, they meant the never again crowd. <laughs> Add your crossed arm photo to a growing global coalition calling for action to end sexual violence as a tactic of war and an impediment to peace. The campaign also produced a YouTube video discussing the harm of sexual violence, much as in Resolution 1820 as a tactic of war. Up to 500,000 women were raped during the Rwanda genocide, as many as 64,000 in Sierra Leone and over 40,000 in the Bosnia and Herzegovina War, 4,500 in a single province of the Democratic Republic of the Congo in just six months. And every day, hundreds of women are raped in Darfur. These are not the random acts of individual soldiers. They are military tactics used to shame and demoralize women, tear communities apart, 
and control populations. Many women and girls suffer torture and mutilation in front of their families. Others are impregnated to shift the ethnic balance of territories. All face the physical, emotional, and social consequences of rape. This must end, but we need your help. Together, we can make a difference by helping to change the attitudes that perpetuate violence against women, by changing the laws and policies that provide impunity for offenders, by uniting in defiance to end this crime against humanity. Together, we will stop rape. Um, later, the campaign enlisted the help of Charlize Theron and Nicole Kidman, Kidman in the production of a second video. Theron had recently been named a UN ambassador for peace for her work focusing, uh, according to the UN quote, at focusing attention and mobilizing efforts on social issues, particularly in her native South Africa, end quote. Kidman had, since early 2006, been a goodwill ambassador for the UN Development Fund for Women, now UN Women. Such bringing together of celebrities with the aim of creating primarily in, in the global north, including stars in South Africa, um, a sense of outrage about what's happening in the global south has become big business. As John Colapinto explains in a March 2012 New Yorker article on what he calls the new boom in celebrity philanthropy, celebrities sometimes hire companies to help them determine what causes to support. For a not insubstantial fee, $25,000 a month, um, for example, the Global Philanthropy Group will work with celebrities to determine where the stars should put their attention and money. As part of the process, the Global Philanthropy Group asks them 100 quick fire questions, including what fills you with outrage when you watch the news? What awakens your empathy? And what did your family talk about at the dinner table? <laughs> Some critics have pointed out, with regard to both celebrity charity and celebrity diplomacy, that celebrities' passions rather than expert judgment, guide their allocation of funds and also the priorities given to foreign policy. Others have suggested that simply taxing stars at a realistic rate would make more sense <laughs> than, having, than having celebrities benefit from their charitable whims, particularly given that celebrities tend to avoid complex issues. As Colapinto points out, quote, a complex issue like healthcare policy reform may seem less appropriate to a starlet's brand than taking a stand against puppy mills, end quote. And that might lead us to ask whether sexual violence is more like healthcare here or puppy mills in the way they're described. I didn't know if I should say that. Um, <laughs> UN Action works within this framework of both deploying the passions of celebrities and presenting the issues in a way that eschews their complexity. For its video with its chosen movie stars, it also enlisted what the UN considered, quote, high profile personalities, representing the spectrum of actors needed to address sexual violence, end quote. Theron and Kidman thus joined three human rights celebrities, another new category, I would say, that's resulting from the popularization of human rights. Former peacekeeper and retired Dutch Major General Patrick Khmer, Liberian peace activist Lima Gabowie, who has since been awarded a Nobel Peace Prize, and Congolese gynecologist, Dr. Dennis Mukwege. Each has been recognized internationally for work involving sexual violence against women. In a display of celebrity diplomacy in which the legitimacy of the professional humanitarians and stars are mutually reinforcing, the five made an appeal through another YouTube video. Before I show you the video, let me say that I think the campaign relies on celebrities to make intelligible the harm of rape during armed conflict with the aim of producing ideal, benevolent, global citizens who might respond. In the vein of many contemporary American talk and makeover television shows, it depends upon ordinary people's fantasies about becoming celebrities. The campaign, however, betrays the limits to the global citizenship to which it appeals. While it suggests a thin conception of what it means to be an agent of change in the world, it also makes a distinction between women who have been raped during armed conflict and women and men who have not had such experiences. The former, as we saw in the Secretary General's statement and Ban Ki-moon's statement, are largely seen as forever destroyed and not considered potential global citizens. So here's the one minute and 15 second online video, which can be accessed from a link with the Rhone's image on the campaign website. 
She could be your mother, your sister, your daughter. It is perhaps more dangerous to be a woman than a soldier in an armed conflict. Those responsible for sexual violence must be held accountable. Wars are being fought on the bodies of women and children. La violence sexuelle est la monstruosité de notre siècle. Go to stoprapenow.org to learn more and to take action. The website to which obedient viewers are taken offers celebrities and non-celebrities alike the chance to take action. The banner at the top of the main page includes an image of, five, of the five celebrities crossing their arms and a deliberately unidentifiable woman inside an orange text box which reads, get cross, add your image now. Below this banner is a map of the world with an X to indicate all the countries from which people have uploaded fat photographs. So you can click on any given X and you'll uh, see, you'll be able to view all the photographs from that country so that all who have uploaded a photo can have their picture viewed on the same screen as the celebrities. Adding one's picture to the website, um, the website makes clear, is a way to take action. So they have ways you can take action and one is upload your, your, your picture. It's offered as one of the things that viewers can do to stop the use of rape as a weapon of war. Now, to whom are these appeals made? To take action in this way requires that one speak English, have access to the internet, a camera, and equipment for uploading photographs. Moreover, the campaign relies on the association that people will make with celebrities, including a desire for imitative connection, um, imitative connection with the beautiful and famous. Women who have been victims of rape and war are apparently not intended as recipients of this message or as agents of change. Recall that Theron invites audience members to imagine that the words on the screen, and of course they're only words, are those of their mothers, sisters, or daughters. The message is not aimed at victims, or given that the request relies on imagination, right? Imagine that's who they are to you, even their families. This view, I believe, is representative of the broader understanding of the harm of rape articulated by the UN Security Council, the UN Secretary General, and those in control of drafting the resolutions for the Council. But it's also, as we have, uh, as we have seen, been significant, not been significantly challenged by, any of, by those who call for a different focus. So in conclusion, um, I'll think about how we might attempt to challenge the representations, and this is just one of many ideas. But I want to return now at the end of my talk to the distinctions that the resolutions and the debates about them reinforce between victims and agents when talking about women, and later more broadly. Feminist scholars or activists uneasy with the focus on women's victimization saw 1325 as a victory precisely because it suggested that women were not only victims but could be agents for change as peacemakers. I would caution against readily accepting such a move as a sign of pro progress. Might it simply add to the roles and responsibilities of women? As Hillary Charlesworth has pointed out, now women are responsible for making peace. Without questioning the view that victimization necessarily results from sexual violence, or that agency comes with being responsible for peace. As already suggested in the end, somewhat paradoxically, the gender component is lost with regard to sexual violence. Boy and girl children, and presumably men, can be victims. What is to be gained, though, by creating new identity categories of raped and or sexually assaulted civilians, particularly when shame and stigmatization are seen invariably to attach to such violence. Could we imagine categories beyond violated or peacemaking women and violated and violating men? Could we open ourselves up to the, up to the multiple, de multiple desires of women and men, economic, social, sexual, and political, without reinforcing assumptions about shame and stigmatization or even about peace? Women's and men's lives, including their security issues, 
do not need to revolve around such dichotomies. So let me offer the, in many ways, banal example of a study done a few years ago by the Physicians for Human Rights on the situation of women in refugee camps in Darfur <coughs> to suggest a possibility that I want to make clear they don't suggest. Um, but I think it suggests a possibility for opening up space for rethinking the categories on which human security discourse relies. So essentially, the Physicians on Human Rights wanted to report on incidences of rape um, in, the, in the refugee camps, but feared that few women would come to talk to them about it if they made clear that's what they wanted. So instead, they issued a broad invitation for women in the camps to speak with them about their, quote, health and lives in the camps. While the interviewers included questions about sexual violence because they went beyond their lives in the camps, they made those questions appear not to be the central concern of their interviews. And what then happened did surprise the researchers, and in fact, I believe, challenged the assumptions that many had made about the effect of sexual violence on the lives of women in Darfur. Of the 88 women interviewed, 32 reported at least one incidence of sexual violence. But a majority reported health and safety concerns other than sexual violence, particularly their need for more and better quality food, and I think most importantly, something feminists don't necessarily want to hear, their profound desire to return home um, to their farms in Darfur. Though it occurred accidentally, the women's expressions of their needs and desires allow for at least a slight shift in the understanding of human security, even but not only for women who had been subjected to sexual violence. Suggesting categories such as those who desire to return home those in need of food um, as alternatives to some of the categories we think of, maybe. They did not articulate the desire to participate in peace building, that might have been a surprise, or to see international criminal justice, both of which are generally assumed they want. In contrast to relying on fixed and permanent identities based on injury, such as raped women, such reconfiguration of desire potentially allows for the I am statements that Wendy Brown calls for in states of injury. Those statements, when properly read, are, quote, potentially in motion, as temporal, as not I, as deconstructible according to a genealogy of want, rather than as fixed interests and experiences, end quote. I concur with Brown's aim, with the hope of, however so slightly, reopening a desire for futurity rather than harboring rancor or ressentiment. Thank you. <laughs>